In May 2015, when Pope Francis published his encyclical Laudare Si, I will admit I was one of those people who thought, really, the environment, surely there's more important issues to discuss. And I did push it aside, never took it as seriously as I should or as I was called to, um, and just ignored it for a while until I got to study it a little while later. Tonight, in this episode, we're discussing with Father Niall Leahy, uh, recently ordained Irish Jesuit priest, just about where Laudato Si comes, where does it actually fit in to the Catholic teaching, what is our role in it, um, and where does Jesus, where does God, where does Christ come uh, in this encyclical? Um, I ask you, if it's something, an issue that you've pushed aside before, like I have, come at this with an open mind, listen to it, and at the end, make up uh, your own mind. But this was a, an interview I really, really uh, enjoyed and learned a lot from Father Niall. So I hope you enjoy. God bless. So you're very welcome, everybody, to the next episode of Paving the Way Home and delighted to be joined again by a very recent guest, Father Niall Leahy, Jesuit priest, Irish Jesuit priest, joining us tonight from Paris. Father Niall, you're very welcome. Brian, nice to see nice to see you again and delighted to be back on the on the podcast. Oh, no, it's, it's fantastic. And thank you so much for giving of your uh, of your time. Um, so Father Niall, before we begin, actually, can I ask you to lead us in an opening prayer? Absolutely, right. Yep. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. Uh, we thank you for the gifts of faith, hope, and love. Uh, bless this conversation. Um, send your Holy Spirit uh, to, to Brian and me and to all the listeners uh, so that we may come to a renewed appreciation of, of your creation and an understanding of how you want us uh, to live within your creation. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, Father Niall, tonight, um, tonight we're going to, uh, how am I going to say this? I was going to say we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna speak about a hot issue. It's not really a hot issue, but it's been made into a hot issue. But we're going to be talking about uh, Pope Francis' papal encyclical uh, about the environment, Laudato Si'i. Um, now, I think we're, we're all away, aware that, you know, th there's a lot of controversy and rumors and, and, and everything out there surrounding, surrounding so many things at the, at, at the moment. And, uh, especially about, you know, so, so often throughout this papacy about, uh, Pope Francis and, you know, you have a lot of people asking when this encyclical came out. Um, like, why are people, why is the Holy Father speaking about uh, the environment when there are so many more important and Catholic issues to um, to discuss? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, you're right. You're right, Brian. It, from from word go, it was it was controversial, or it was made as it was made controversial, uh, and uh, one of of the ways that people were attacking, attacking it was by trying to play it off with other issues. You know, why this issue? Why this issue? Why the why care for the environment? Why why isn't he talking about marriage or family or sexuality or abortion or uh, you know and, and sort of playing issues off? Uh, and. I think ultimately, you know, the only answer to that is to say, look, we're Catholics, which means we care about all of these things. We, uh, um, Pope Benedict uh, is quoted actually in, in Laudato Si saying, the book of nature is one, it's, it's unity. And you can't sort of just focus on one aspect of it. And for, I think Pope Francis had to write this encyclical for a number of reasons. Uh, foremost of which was that previous popes had increasingly started talking about this issue. Uh, let's start with, with John Paul II. Uh, John Paul, Pope Saint John Paul II, 
uh, actually coined a new a new term uh, called ecological conversion and, and asking Christians to undergo an ecological conversion and which means basically living out the ecological dimension of your of your Christian faith uh, caring for the planet so uh, and he in his in his first encyclical as well uh, he he uh, redemptor hominis he he said that we need to stop looking at nature as a just purely as a, a sort of supply of of goods you know for us to consume uh, we're not respecting nature well so from the get-go john paul ii was on this and he's worried about it benedict 16 takes it up as well uh, he was he was actually known at one point as the green pope or he was in some circles he was being called that because he he, he was so explicit about this uh, and his concern was such uh, for the environment and so previous popes had been you know i mean speaking more and more about it and uh, I would say as well that there are certain and certain elements of the church, John Paul II and Benedict were ignored on this, that there, you know, the, the, the Catholic media didn't cover it, uh, that they were saying this and it didn't suit maybe political agendas at the time. So uh, and no more than it suits political agendas now. So it was kind of just ignored and, you know, airbrushed out, uh, literally. Um, so uh, that that's a little bit of the background, and of course, you know, in the just in the in the regular you know scientific community and and, and people then who are ecologically sensitive, as as the as the data coming in has been getting worse and worse and worse, the the volume has been going up and up on on people's concerns. So I think Francis just sort of had to you know say what what do we as Catholics believe about this situation and about you know the. How, we, how are we supposed to live within, as, as children of God, how are we supposed to live within God's creation and the, and the limits of God's creation? Because it's, it's not an infinite creation. We, we live as if it's infinite and we can just keep producing and consuming as, you know, just keep that GDP going up, 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 you know. I mean, that's the way we live, as if we live within an infinite creation, but we don't. We live within a finite creation. Only God is infinite. Uh, his creation is finite. And so what, what does that mean? So, yeah, it's, I, just to repeat what you said, Brian, it's, it's not controversial from a Catholic point of view. It's, it's probably controversial from particular ideological, political, sort of cultural ideological points of view. Uh, but as Catholics, it's, as from a Catholic theological point of view, it's not at all. It's, it's perfectly, you know, it's, it's, it's our tradition. It's part of our magisterium. And, and Laudato Si is probably just, it's an encyclical which is the clearest and uh, I would say most comprehensive treatment uh, that we've had of it up until now. So it's, it's really something for, for Catholics to pay attention to. It's a very interesting point you make there because, you know, a lot of people might be inclined to, you know, put any, all this stuff um, to do with the environment and all that kind of a thing, even more into kind of, I, I don't even want to say social justice, but almost trying to park it in the category like that and say that, you know, well, as Catholics now, we need to focus on, you know, the real nitty gritty stuff like the, you know, like the, the, the sacraments, the, all these topics like uh, abortion, everything. And, I suppose the important point to make is these topics are not being watered down in the slightest and they're not being pushed aside, you know, as Catholics, I guess, and correct me here if I'm wrong, that like everything, everything in this world that God has, has, has created, um, you know, it, it must be given, I, I, I must be given some kind of a review, some kind of oversight uh, by us, because everything has been entrusted to us as human beings uh, by God to, to, to care for it. Now, look, I, I, even the way I describe that now is, is is wrong, as I don't even want to be sounding as if I'm putting, you know, issues like abortion and all that uh, to the side. But, you know, I, I guess you, you you understand what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You can't, you can't play these issues off one another, and that's yeah. what, that's you know, there, there will always be 
uh, sort of media organizations out there that want to create sort of little pockets in society, people who really care about this or people who really care about that. And as Catholics, we have to sort of resist that uh, and say, no, we're not, we're, you're not going to pigeonhole us into some little pocket, uh, some, some little, ident you know, political identity or color. We're, we're, no, we uh, are, our God is too big for that. And, and the things God cares about, everything. Uh, and that's why we care about everything, is because ultimately God cares about it. He created all of his creation and he cares for all of it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can't, you, you can't pigeonhole us into, uh, and, and, and I would say that, you know, when we say, when we say, Brian, that we're, we're sort of uh, in the world, but not of the world, you know, that, that saying, uh, which, is, which is true, which is a, a sort of an old principle in, in, in the faith, that means that we shouldn't be too comfortable with any sort of worldly political identity or you know any sort of worldly as, as important as politics is there should be a way in which okay we have to vote some way or other but we shouldn't shouldn't always be very comfortable with the way we ultimately vote we say okay i voted i voted for this party this time for that reason but i sort of did so be, un, unfortunately you know they don't deal with this particular issue that i also care about so not that's part of being i think being comfortable you're getting not comfortable, being used to caring about more things than your say your political allegiance actually cares about and that and we live in a fallen world and there you go uh it's it's like that uh, but not to get too comfortable with any sort of worldly political cultural uh pigeonhole as such uh, that's yeah. and i suppose yeah and suppose in some ways like People's first loyalty, as we were saying earlier, shouldn't be to a political party, should be to God. Um, and that like God is in the number one place uh, always um, and everything else comes after that. After that, your your vocation, if you're a if you're a husband, in my, in my case, after God, it's in my wife, then my kids and everything else after that. Um, but look, it's just in the in the world we live in today when you know social media is is rampant and it, it people you know people can have all different ideas and put it out there but sometimes it you can see like i, I guess those depending on the country you're living in um depending what's going on at that time it's very easy to fall into the trap that your whole life your whole everything becomes consumed with a political party and all that but when kind of forgetting that you know what god is greater and he needs to be in the one, number one. And um, I was actually thinking that today. Uh, funny enough, I was in my own, uh, in my parish church doing prayers this morning and the crib was still there. And I was just looking at Joseph and Mary over the child Jesus. And I was just thinking of the political situation at that time, just after we know the story, uh, King Herod finds out from the wise men, as we learned this week during the Feast of Epiphany, that you know, the savior has been born. King Herod wants to know where, when, who, so he can pay homage. Um, and then you have all these, you know, any, any male under the age of two years of age is is gone out, you know, has, has to be killed and everything. And, you know, that was completely out of the control of Mary and Joseph and the child Jesus. And the only thing they could do was be faithful and loyal to what God was asking them, which at that time was, you know, to Joseph, get up and bring your family to Egypt. And it it just kind of struck me that, you know, no matter what's going on in the world, what's going on in society, this time tonight or this time tomorrow, I could be taken away. Uh, my time could be up. And am I actually ready? Am I ready? Is my soul in a state of grace to meet the Lord? And um, it just kind of struck me that, you know, sometimes we can get so caught up in, in these other issues that we may kind of forget you know what's ultimately important um and that's the number one our relationship with god and you know getting our ourselves right our souls right for because we do not know the day or the hour yeah and absolutely uh brian like that you know when we look at the at the state of the world today and 
you know, and, and, and chapter one of, of the encyclical, I think sort of paints, it's, it's, it's difficult reading to be honest, Brian, because Pope Francis just gives an overview of the state of the natural world as it is looking at various issues, looking at uh, climate change, looking at the loss of, you know, this destruction of, of habitat and creatures and uh, pollu a huge amounts of pollution. Like you see, like there's, did you ever, did you ever see those pictures of, of the plastic in the oceans? Like there's these yeah. kind of islands, massive islands of, of plastic. Like the world is turning into a bit of a, a rubbish tip. Um, and yeah, I mean, water quality, soil quality, there's just so many, like, the, like the, it's like the planet's just kind of exhausted or something at the moment. And like chapter one is, you know, if hopefully some of the some of the viewers, listeners want to will will actually look up the encyclical and read it. Uh, chapter one's hard going, you know, it's it doesn't paint a pretty picture, and that is that is in some way a reflection of us, you know, as uh, uh, and our and our spiritual and our spiritual lives, and it's. And I think that's part of the, the challenge of saying, yes, like this, you know, ugly, very, you know, the way we've sort of defaced uh, the natural world. Uh, you can't just separate that from what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, like no more than like if you if you walked into your house, Brian, and you know, the place was in a mess and the kids were running wild. And uh, <laughs> I turned this camera around right now. <laughs> well, it looks very, it looks very <laughs> tidy from here. <laughs> um, it looks very, but you know what I mean? Like if, you know, if the, if the, if, the, if, the, if, if your house was just out of control and, uh, you know, tumbled down and not cared for, you know, people would be saying, Brian, what's going on in there? What's going on yeah. in there and you? Uh, and in your and in your relationship with God, there's something not right with your yeah. relationship with God because it's just falling down around you, and have you haven't been caring for this? Or yeah. it's the same when we look at like so that's your your domestic home. Uh, when we look at our common home, uh, which uh, which is the, that's the term Francis used and Benedict used before him for the uh, for the planet. When we look at our common home, we say, oh "My God, it's in a mess." That's that is related to what's going on in here and mm. our relationship with God. And uh, something's not right. If something is, if our relationship with the creation has gone awry badly, well then as Catholics, as Christians, we can say, yeah, that's because our relationship with God has gone awry in some way. And we need to, we need to fix all of that. You know, we need to fix all of that. So, uh, yeah, how did, how did we get onto that? I don't know. Um, but um... even as you're talking there, like <clears throat> for, I imagine for you, um, you know, particularly when you were really coming into the faith at whatever stage of your life that was that, you know, Pope John Paul was the Pope and no doubt he had a massive uh, influence um, on your life. It was the same in me. I was, I was really coming into my faith towards the end of Pope John Paul II's uh, papacy and, uh, you know, he had a massive, massive effect on me, even going over his writings and, and everything. And then we had Pope Benedict. And again, um, I, you know, I absolutely love Pope ben Benedict, um, you know, and his writing, you know, a, a lot say he'll probably be a doctor of the church one day. Uh, and, you know, it, it would be fantastic if so, if God wills it. But when you look at them, Pope John Paul grew up in, um, in in Poland, as we know, and we, we, we all heard the stories of him uh, going off with students to the mountains, um, canoeing, all these kind of things, going out, teaching, teaching, um, you know, all these young people about God out in the middle of, of you know, all, all, of nature, of the environment, everything. We saw the same with, well, okay, Paul Bendik wasn't, uh, he appears not to be as, active but he came from bavaria another beautiful beautiful part uh, of the world now i don't know anything about argentina so i don't know what paul francis uh ex experienced but particularly with all of them the common thread i've seen with all of them is um you know how how how, how to experience god in nature not just you know not just in this in the sacraments or in, in the church but out in the world as well and um but for some reason that's kind of been lost 
uh, in translation or communication and everything seems to be put back uh, on Pope Francis as if he's changing the direction of the church and, you know, kind of going astray, so to speak. So, yeah, when I remember one, I was at a, a vocations event, actually, and I said something about, you know, that we see and this is part of my mission and uh, somebody this guy who's discerning the priesthood said to me uh, as a priest why should you be talking about this issue why should you not be talking about more spiritual things and uh, well I was I was taken aback because uh, it's for us it's not just the environment it's creation uh, it's God's creation so yeah it's natural but it's also you know, it's a it's a gift uh, from God. So, uh, not all sort of spiritual things have to be sort of supernatural. You know, they can be. You know, as as Catholics, we see as Christians, we see the sort of spiritual dimension or element or of of natural things as well. They're they're still a gift. Like they don't we don't take them for granted. You know, so um, and but I took his point and I said, okay. I should, I still should be talking about this, about the environment, uh, but from a faith perspective, we shouldn't, it's not enough for, for priests and Christians just to, you know, speak about this issue the same way that, you know, a Greenpeace activist would, would speak about it or, you know, and, uh, you know, I think, I think like the Guardian is probably the newspaper, you know, in our part of the world that probably speaks about it the most. Uh, I don't think we should speak about it in the same way as a, a sort of whatever a, an environmental journalist in the Guardian who's speaking to a totally secular audience. That doesn't mean we shouldn't speak about it. It means we should speak about it from a faith perspective. Uh, in the same way that you know, if we're talking about a pro-life issue, uh, you know, there are, there are people, there are religious people and non-religious people who are pro-life. As as religious people, we speak about it. We're sort of in agreement, but we speak about it from a different perspective. Mm. Uh, and from a faith perspective and that's the same I think as, as, as Catholics we need to develop our, our sort of ability to, to talk about this issue gr grounded in you know the reality you know of, of what's out there uh, but speaking about that uh, from a faith perspective so for example you we, we wouldn't talk about uh, so you, you might just talk about you know there might be environmental laws and regulations that that you know that governments bring in uh, uh and, and we might talk about that instead of a just a law we might well well we might talk about laws are there to prevent us from sinning you know i mean that it's that it's not just breaking a rule for us or it's actually a sin uh which is different from you know from breaking a law uh so or or it's uh if we want uh, to to promote good laws, it's a, we could call that sort of you know we want we want to promote virtue, you know in in people you know so we uh, and and holiness you know so you can talk about it uh, in all the you can we do need to talk about this issue, uh, but we do need to talk about it from a faith perspective um, and sort of join those dots. Uh, yeah, that's actually one of the one of the best ways I've heard. Uh, describing a bit of we need to discuss the issue, the issue but from a faith perspective because to be honest you I I'll be the first to admit that when I first heard about this encyclical coming out I was like what the environment I was like I was one of the people even thinking but surely there's more um you know more pressing issues like you know an encyclical on the sacraments or on whatever but I was thinking the environment and that just goes to shows where it was in uh, in my priority of things um and that and it wasn't until a while later um after the encyclical was published and uh in in a group setting that uh people started um you know we started studying it together and it was like oh wow i see now i see now why this is important um <clears throat> Right, just just to just to make the link as well with with one other big issue out there in the church, evangelization. Like yeah. evangelization is huge. New evangelization, John Paul II, uh, you know, uh, and Pope Francis releasing. Um, oh Lord, uh, 
Evangelium Gaudium, Evangelium Gaudium uh, all yeah. about mission, you know, missionary disciples. We're all called missionary disciples. We want to evangelize people. We want to proclaim the gospel. We want people to believe in risen lords, uh, to come into relationship with God, to realize the love of God. But we also recognize that with that new sort of faith horizon in your life, that changes how we live. Mm. That changes how we live. And, and you know, what, what John Paul II was getting at with his idea of ecological conversion is well, one of the ways it changes how you live is that you become more aware and appreciative of or careful of how you use God's creation and, and how yeah. you consume it. Like this is, and I think this is, this is getting to the heart of it really. Like it is, it is, it is really challenging. Like it's not obvious how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to deal with this. Like it's a mm. huge problem. Uh, and there's no, there are no easy answers or, or quick fixes. And yet we realize that we're being called to change. And anytime we are called to change, it's, there's going to be resistance. Like it's hard to change. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's genuinely hard, but, um, you know, so just to relate this again, you know, to, to evangelization and, and sacraments, it's like, okay, yeah, all the, you know, coming into relationship with God, sort of nourishing that relationship, uh, healing that relationship through the sacraments. Yes. And how, what does that change in our lives? What behaviors yep. do, do, does, you know, the gospel and, and going to mass and, and going to confession, you know, what does that change? What things do I bring to confession? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yep. uh, it's not. It's not just enough to go to confession. It's like you have to confess your sins. Yep. Your and I'm saying is, you know, okay. You look at the state of the world. Are you? Have you been part of that? Have you been part of this? You know, if you look over the last two hundred years, you know, the the, the the natural world has done very badly. You know, uh, are you part of that story? Is that a sinful story? Uh, if so, go to confession, change, <laughs> you know, and, and change slowly. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm saying you're just going to change overnight and, you know, no, but let's start. We have to recognize that the movement we've been going in, the direction we've been going in over a long time, uh, you know, at least over for, for 200 years now has been, has been sinful to, to speak about it in a faith perspective. It hasn't just been bad for the environment. It's been bad for God's creation, which means it's been sinful. And therefore, we are called to repent. Jesus didn't just say, believe in the good news. He said, repent and believe in the good news. Uh, and, and Benedict's great in this. You know, he's, he's also, you know, any kind of come, coming to faith uh, always involves, a, he says, an about turn. And this is, uh, this is part of it. This is part of this about turn that we had to make. And, and these, are, these are the things we're bringing to confession. Right? This is one of the things we're bringing to confession, hopefully. And, and maybe this is, you know, if we talk about the Eucharist as, you know, we talk about it as the source and the summit of, of the Christian life. Well, the source of what? Uh, and, and hopefully it's the source of our more environmentally responsible life. Uh, so, yes, uh, evangelization sacraments key <laughs> but how what changes do they help us to make and to sustain in our lives mm -hmm. and and one of those is how we how we live within god's limited creation um so yeah the anyway so so i guess what i'm saying brian is yeah the the tendency is to separate these things out mm -hmm. And to say, oh no, there's spiritual things which are more important, like sacraments, evangelization, the gospel, believing in God, and then there's this sort of environmental stuff, social justice stuff over here, which is not spiritual. And this, I don't know what to say. To that, but you know, you, you, I've said what I said. You know, but like this is not a Catholic way of. This is not Christian. This is not Christian. And I'll stop myself from saying more. You know, have you found? Because I know I was guilty of this that when it first came out that this encyclical on the encyclical, I can't even pronounce it properly, on the environment 
people are almost afraid to embrace it because and they almost whisper that but if i do you know am i betraying the you know all the other important stuff like the sacraments and that so i'll distance myself like they're almost like i kind of want to but you know i'll back off because it's like that inner mindset because even say from my point of view okay Okay, I've been very lucky to travel so many places around the world like yourself, but primarily in Ireland, you know, in general, like I noticed there's problems with the environment in every country, everywhere. But if, if, if you go to, you know, down the street in Ireland, generally places are very clean, uh, things are very good. Whereas I remember when I went to Africa and I spent a few times in Africa and you're in the slums and you just see, or, you know, if, some, if you went to Calcutta or anywhere, and like there's people just living in mountains of rubbish and uh, you know as far as the eye can see and it, it's unbelievable but maybe from a a first world perspective in in the places where things are that little bit better that you know we, we, we we're seeing with a very very narrow lens and you know we're not seeing the whole picture of the of the universe yeah. And, and for that, Brian, I, I would recommend that people read the first chapter of Laudato Si. If, 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 if I were, you know, if, if there's somebody listening for whom this is sort of very new territory, you know, or, or, or maybe they have been avoiding it or, or haven't known how exactly how to, how to get into it, um, I would say read, read the introduction and read the first chapter. And that will... That will give you a lot to think about. That's that's all it's it because the first chapter really does take this bird's eye view. Like it, it takes you out of your, you know, we all, you know, your 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 regular life and you know, yeah. In in the West, we're not faced with the the consequences really of our of our lifestyles. You know, the we 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 tend to export our rubbish or the smoke goes into the sky or we don't we don't see the effects of our lifestyle, the negative effects always. Reading that first chapter, like I work, like it's hard going, you know, when when you see it all, when it's all put in front of you, you go, God, God, we've really made a mess of this place. And it's it's important to face that. Like if we don't, it's going to come back and bite us in the ass if we don't. Excuse my excuse my language, but it will. Hey, you're in France. Excuse your French. <laughs> excuse my French. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, but uh, yeah, like let's face this. Let's face this sort of, you know, toxic situation now while we still can and go, OK, it's really ugly. Uh, I'd, I'd prefer to look away, but uh, read that first chapter and you go, OK. Um, and, and then say, you know, is, is this a moral issue? Is this a moral issue? Uh, well, if it is, well, then let's, OK, let this, let this become part of your repenting and believing the good news yeah excellent like and i know you you're doing actually that brought my attention to this but like even as we we record this on it's the 9th of january um and in the past few days there was an rte news piece on how the year 2020 was the hottest year in record yeah yeah a tide tied with uh, 2016 and and the last decade has been the hottest decade on on record uh, I, um you know so you know brian like i mean the and, and climate climate change and you know rising global warming it's just one of the issues it's it's yeah. a very important issue but it's it's one of the issues uh, and we shouldn't reduce care to our care of the environment to just global warming or, or climate change even though because um, there are lots of other issues as well but yeah, the, the general trend has been, yeah, the, 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 the temperature has been going up. And again, I'd be saying, you know, is this a moral issue? Is this a moral issue or not? Is, is this just like another, is this just a number? Uh, you know, so we're aiming to, to keep the, the planet's average temperature below 1.5 degrees higher than the pre-industrial level. So like 200 years ago, uh, the average global temperature was, I think, about 1.1 degree cooler than it is now. Every, you know, the average, and 
uh, and it's gone up to risen by one point, I think it's 1.1 now, 1 to 1.1 degree higher than it was 200 years ago. And if we go up to 1.5 or, or God forbid up to two, the climate scientists tell us that's, that's really, really terrible news for, for human civilization. It's bad, it's bad news for the planet, um, clearly, but, but terrible, terrible news for us uh, because it, yeah, anyway, I don't, I won't, I won't, I'm not going to get into doomsday sort of uh, scenarios, but, um, and just to say, yeah, is this, is this a moral issue or not? Uh, and am I, am I part of this story of, of the planet getting hotter? Mm. Uh, and I, uh, and I think, you know, one of, one of the, just slightly changed tack now, Brian, but um, one of the very interesting you know, one of the very interesting questions is why do some people care about this a lot and some people don't? Because it seems, you know, when you just look at it, it's like, okay, well, this is this is clearly a big deal. So so why is it that that some people just don't seem to care about it uh, that much? And you know, I did I didn't care about it for I suppose it's in the last five years that it's it's really come come into my life and in a big bigger way. And there's uh you know, listeners might be have heard of the the five stages of grief. When 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 you lose somebody or something, you know, even like there, uh, there's five stages of grief. Uh, people tend to go through. One is denial. Uh, no, it's not happening. This this isn't happening uh, in some way. Next is uh, can I remember them all? Uh, uh, anger. Uh, okay, it is happening, and I'm and I'm not happy about it. Uh, the third is bargaining uh okay well you try and make uh you try and cut a deal in some way uh, the fourth is depression oh god we're doomed uh oh no this is all this is the worst thing ever <laughs> life is over uh um, and uh and fifth is acceptance finally coming to a place of acceptance and i think it's interesting for for people to try and you know, locate yourself on that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, some, for example, uh, I I would say a lot of people uh, um, who would be. I I know a lot of people anyway who would be in the bargaining stage, where it's like, okay, I know it's an issue. You know, I've been reading the newspapers. I know it's a big issue. Uh, I accept that now. Um, so I tell you what, I won't eat meat one day a week. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Okay. Are we, are we good now? <laughs> we good, God. Um, and it's sort of saying, okay, well, I'll meet you halfway. And when, when really, you know, it, it would, if I sort of liken that to maybe if an alcoholic recognized he had a problem and he said, well, I'll tell you what, then like, I won't drink on Wednesdays. It's like, uh, <laughs> that's, okay <laughs> that's a good start maybe but it's not you're you're still drinking six other days you know so um so yeah it's it is a, it is a human journey brian to to realize that this is you know once once you sort of open yourself up to the reality of the state their planet's in it's like okay it's going to take some time to come to terms with that and to say okay i'm and, and to, to change and to care and uh, not to get not to get depressed about it like that's yeah. I certainly went through that uh, you know when the, the voice like oh it's just bad news it's bad news it's bad news um, and I've come to a stage now where I say okay God's not asking me to like solve this problem he's not asking he's not asking Father Nile to to save the planet. Uh, he's just asking me to do something, you know, to be faithful. I, th I think it was it was it Mother Teresa who said, "God doesn't ask us to be successful, but to be, yeah, to be faithful. faithful." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I that really resonates with me with this. It's like, okay, um, uh, it might happen that the world, you know, sorry, we're talking about raising global temperatures. It might happen that by the time we get to 2050, uh, 30 years time, that the world's temperature has risen to two degrees, you know, over and, and it's bad news. 
well, I'm still going to do the right thing. God is not asking me to guarantee that we'll keep it low. We'll keep it to 1.5. He's asking me to do my bit. And, you know, and when I go, when I meet the Lord, when I die and I meet the Lord, I'll say, okay, yeah, Lord, I didn't, I didn't save the day, uh, but I did my bit, you know, and I tried and we came up short, but God's not judging me on, on whether we saved the day or not, but did we do our bit? And, and again, that's just another way of taking a faith perspective on it. Uh, that yes, we, we are in this warming, so, you know, uh, trajectory, uh, we're, we're one, at least one degree higher, hotter than it was, uh, say, 200 years ago, before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but we, let's try and, you know, sort of a bit like the, the COVID statistics, like, let's try and try and taper it off, you know, let's try and flatten the curve or something like that. And uh, so that, um, and, and, and that requires all of us just to do our bit. And yeah um and not to get yeah I, you know if people out there or there might be some people out there who who have been dealing you know are engaged with this issue and maybe have been getting depressed about it and they feel it's a hopeless situation just remember god's not asking you to be successful god's asking you to be faithful that reminds me of now our listeners may know the whole story or yourself but i remember hearing a story of um I, I can't remember the details of who or what but of i think it was a monk and he was gardening uh w- one of his jobs was to look after the garden of the monastery and and he was asked like if you were told that the world is going to end you know in in half an hour what would you do and he said i'd continue gardening because that's what that's what my duty is that's what uh that's what god has will for me to do so when he comes i want him to find what he wants me to do um and in some way that relates to what you're saying that you know even even if things are heading towards a you know disaster level we're still called to do our bit um like that regardless of the outcome we still have a duty um and 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 to do our bit um climate change is a relatively new concept and there's a lot of people who, you know, they, they, they might have no interest in religion or anything, but they very much made the climate and climate change their God. And it kind of relates back to what we were saying earlier about people, you know, putting their first loyalty to a political party um, and not necessarily to God. And a lot of the time, you know, a lot of these people, um, I don't want to be pigeonholing or judging now but i'm just coming from my own my own perception of the whole situation was a lot of these people may have been a little bit of a i don't want to say a turn off but when the whole concept then for catholics came you need to put a bit more emphasis on the environment you're kind of thinking well you know my own experience of people putting emphasis on the environment was these people who made it a god a religion and that too is unhealthy. And that's not what we're well, what people are being asked to hear. Again, they're saying this is just another part of creation, another part of what God wants us to look after, just as He wants us to, He doesn't want us to fight for pro-life any less or you know, any other issues any less. This is just another issue. We're not asked to be to make it our God, our God and our sole issue, but we're still asked to, you know, put a bit more attention uh, on it. And because it's a new concept um, and science is teaching us more and more about it every day, like you said earlier on, it takes a bit of a change in our part. And that can be a slow, gradual process, just like conversion. We're all going to be, we're all converting, regardless of how close we are to God. We're all converting right up to the, the last moment of our life, trying to come closer to God. And, you know, this is just another issue as well that god is asking us to to put a bit of focus on so yeah brian you're, you're spot on um and pope in the in the in the encyclical in the dash uh, pope francis actually is critical of some very i would say some very secular ideological approaches approaches to caring for the environment one of them which he which he singles out is 
uh, and, and a lot of Catholics are, are rightfully worried about this. And I think this is one of the issues that made them sort of stay away or keep their distance from environmentalism in general, was that some people out there would say the main problem is that there are now 7 billion people on the earth and we need to cut that down. If we, yeah. cut, if, if we cut that down, well then, you know, get rid of the people, get rid of the problem. And and that's, yeah, that, that pe people, there are environmentalists who say that and who support that idea. And obviously Catholics are not comfortable with that. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be involved in environmentalism. It means we should be involved in another type of environmentalism. And, mm -hmm. and, and Pope Francis kind of calls that out and say, yes, this is not, the problem is not that there are too many people. Uh, the problem is that people are living at, at, at an unsustainable lifestyle, that mm -hmm. we need to live in a way which allows seven people, seven billion people to live on this planet. That's uh, so, uh, and again, uh, Benedict XVI was very strong on this. He says, you know, uh, and, he, and he called on richer nations to sort of live a more sober lifestyle. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, um, it's, yeah. So yeah, just to say like there, there is a, as, as you point out, uh, there, there are strands of environmental movements out there that Catholics, Christians are not comfortable with. And I'd say, yes, you're, you're right not to be comfortable with. So if they're doing it the wrong way, you should do it the right way. Uh, it's not that you should avoid it. It's like, let's do it the right way. And we need to develop. Uh, and and there, are, there, are, there are more and more sort of Christian environmental uh, organizations now. Um, and so I, I, I know one is called A Russia, and, 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 and they help congregations and parishes to, you know, to, to make this part of their life. So anyway, yeah, so in, yeah, I'm just repeating myself, uh, people are right to be sort of wary of certain ideological approaches to environmentalism. That doesn't mean they should keep their distance from environmentalism, it means they should do it right, do it the right way. That's fantastic. Um, you know, it sounds so simple. And yet, like, even as I'm listening to you tonight, I'm like, you know, there, there, there's suddenly like clicks going off of my mind going, actually, that makes sense. That makes sense. Because like, I'm, I'm not going to pretend like I was the first to say, oh, the environment, that's for radicals. And oh, man, okay, the Pope is writing this encyclical in it, but the environment and that, but yeah like you know there's been for myself there's been a a very slow process to come to come around to that but even listen to yourself there that's that's amazing because sometimes there's like we look out and we see there's one or two ways there's either be an extreme and make the environment your god or not but as you say well you know as catholics there's a, there's also another way we can approach a situation and if that is not being, um, I suppose, promoted or not even being done in whatever area you are. Well, that's actually another option that we can do. And uh, that's fantastic. Sorry, I'm repeating what you said, but I'm repeating yeah, for yeah. my own, yeah. um, own purpose uh, here. And I think it's important for, for the listeners to, to realize that, yeah, if, if this is something you care about, yeah, there are other Catholics who care about it too. And yeah. let's let's do it. Let's, let's yeah. do it in a Christian way. And for for Christian reasons, uh, yep. you know, the, the, you know, when we were talking earlier, Brian, like part, part of the, part of the problem is, you know, what, what do we do? Uh, what, what actions do we take? And, and that's a kind of a combination of what I'm, I make personal changes in my own life. And I also uh, encourage, you know, wider culture and, and, and political parties to make good decisions as well, good policy decisions. So there's there's a sort of individual and, and collective, but there's also the why, and and I think this is, and this is sort of chapter two of of the encyclical, the Doubt of Sea, which gives us all the the scripture and the the tradition, theological tradition of the church, which really gives us the why uh, mm. that and uh, why we do this, and 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 especially if if we feel like you know, or oh, some people will feel depressed and it's like, oh, this situation is beyond beyond us now. And 
And I said, like, well, as Christians, we have a very deep, deep why, a very deep, deep reason for continuing in this way and for doing the right thing. And even if it looks like, you know, this is going to end badly, uh, we, we still have a reason for being faithful. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that's, so chapter two is just a beautiful, beautiful exposition of uh, the, the, from the story of creation, uh, you know, the Genesis stories, uh, humanity's relationship with the natural world and all of that. Uh, then, you know, through the Old Testament into the New Testament, um, and then into uh, big theologians uh, and saints. Um, uh, it's all there. It's all there. It's 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 really a it's a it's a beautiful journey through you know all the, all those scriptures and 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 the church's theological traditions. Very readable. That's the other thing I would say to people at Odyssey. It's actually really readable. Yeah. Uh, it's not like Francis is. He's very informed as a writer, but he wants. He wants to reach a broad audience. You don't need a degree in theology to read Laudato Si. Like it's very, very readable, and chapter two especially. And and you know, people will recognize so much of it already. Like it's not. Um, so yeah, that 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 why and that gives us the why. Why do we do it? Um, there was something else I wanted to say. That, oh yes, uh, we mentioned earlier. Uh, big part of the why for us as Christians is Christ. <laughs> um, and, and it's a, so I, I did, a, I did a, a master's in this stuff last year in, in London, uh, sort of theology and ecology together and, and, and looking at all this and Laudato Si was a central part of that, that um, master's program. But it dawned on me about halfway through the year, maybe one of the reasons that Christians don't care about environmental issues so much is because we never speak about it in terms of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want Christians to care about something and to understand something, talk about Jesus Christ. Like he, yeah. Jesus Christ is the center, central figure in, in our faith. You know, he's, he's the one who reveals God. He's, <laughs> I mean, it's why and how do we speak about the environment uh, in a way, you know, with reference to Jesus Christ and how we do that? Well, one way of doing that is we actually say it every Sunday. We say it every Sunday in when we recite the creed at mass and we say through him, all things were made through him, all things were made. And the hymn of that sentence is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, through him, all things were made. So, so the, we, our understanding of, of creation is that it comes from the Father. Uh, you might think is sort of initiated in a way or something by the, by the Father, but it sort of happened through the Son. Uh, and... That's Jesus, you know, second person of the Trinity was incarnate in, in Jesus, uh, became incarnate in, in the man Jesus. And um, we were very quick, I think over the years, like Jesus is our redeemer. Uh, he died and rose again uh, so that we could uh, to win the victory over sin. Uh, and and we, we focus on him as our savior, sort of Lord and redeemer, uh, but God the Son was also there in the beginning. And the creation, like everything, uh, was made through him. And once you make that connection, you're thinking, you start thinking, okay, we, you know, Jesus means a lot to me. <laughs> like Jesus is my Lord. <laughs> Uh, Jesus is the one who who gives me life and you know I pray to Jesus and you know I mean and it's like oh my god all things are made through him right I need to start looking after all the things that were made through him yeah. you know it's and I think it's really important like if I could if there's any priests out there listening or people who preach 
uh, or teach the faith, uh, I would say, please emphasize this point. If you're talking about environmentalism or, or caring for the planet, please just mention that line of the, of the creed, through him all things are made, and help people to make the link with Jesus. Uh, that Jesus is also, the set, God the Son was also part of the creation uh, process. So, um, yeah, how does that sound? How does that sound, Brian? That's very good. No, I was only just thinking there because, you know, when 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 you study theology obviously you kind of get into a lot of those things but before i started studying um the philosophy and theology i kind of realized like just how basic my faith was and even not having a proper understanding so even that concept that you know everything was created through jesus but yet you're thinking well hold on a second Jesus was born 2000 years ago in Bethlehem and blah, blah, blah. How does that happen? We kind of realized that, you know, Jesus, uh, the the son, the word existed through all time, but just not uh, in human form through all time. So as God created the world, everything was created through the son, through Jesus, uh, even, you know, right at at, at the very beginning. Um, And that because I know, um, I know one or two of our listeners maybe will, might, might be a bit confused at that or might not understand it because I know I myself was in that situation um, before. But when you look at it from that angle, you kind of go, oh, wow, it kind of makes you sit up and go, um, you know, it's almost like when you're <laughs> when you're in school and you're falling asleep at the back of the class. The next thing, the, the teacher calls your name, you haven't been listening, you stand up, you go, <laughs> oh, no. What is this? You know, and, and when you when it's almost like that, you're like, oh wow, actually Jesus is involved here, and you kind of sit <laughs> sitting up and you go, oh wow, actually, you know, I I, I better cut myself on. <laughs> yeah, better better pay attention. It's yeah. yeah, it's a. I mean, the the piece of scripture to read for this, Brian, is the the prologue, the start, the very beginning of the the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. Yeah. And the, you know, and the Word was 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 God, and Word was with God, and um, uh, and that's. You know, it is that divine word made flesh. That's that's Jesus, uh, and 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 it helps when we understand creation a little bit more, a little bit better, and we understand that it was made through the Son. Um, well, then it also helps us then to understand Jesus better. It's like, mm. oh, this, okay, okay, I knew Jesus. You know, people, I think your average Christian would sort of you know understand that jesus died and rose again uh, that's you know the death and resurrection is central obviously but uh, it, it is one of those moments when it dawns on people it's like oh he he was there at the beginning as you know as the second person as the son and that that eternal person mm. is what was made flesh in the in the womb of mary it's like Mm. wow <laughs> like it doesn't just it, it obviously helps you to appreciate creation more it also helps you to appreciate jesus more just for realizing the like the mind-bending yeah uh, you know awe-inspiring mystery that is the incarnation that of what happened in mary's womb it's like yeah wow okay <laughs> it blows you know it's mind-blowing it's uh awe-inspiring you know i mean it's, it's so yeah, uh, what can I say? Uh, it's a mystery. Um, but before we go on to chapter three, and actually I must uh, commend you there, as the conversation was going along, you slipped so subtly and nicely and smoothly into, and that's where chapter one brings us, and in chapter two, and I was like, that was a very good move. It was uh, it was so subtly done, I meant to say, I was smiling <laughs> to myself here. But I was actually just thinking as well of another blockage maybe for Catholics uh, and Christians towards the environmental issues. Um, and I won't delay you any, any further at that. But what I was just thinking was, you know, at the moment, you know, the buzzword among many politicians, uh, in no matter what country you're in, is climate change, climate change, and all this kind of thing. And a lot of the time, you know, I, I suppose it's just the way things have gone. A lot of the time we've heard you know, all various politicians in no matter what country, I guess, you know, they might say one thing and then policies change to go in a different uh, direction. And people are like, oh, man, here we go. Um, 
like I, I know here in Ireland, you know, or even around the time prior to the abortion referendum, there was so many saying, oh, yes, I'm pro-life. Once they got in, maybe turned around. And then because the, the, the topic of climate change becomes a buzzword, not in politicians and world leaders and people are like, OK, is the lack of trust gone? So whatever they're going to speak about, we'll just discard and throw in the bin. Um, I don't know. I could be wrong. There is just it was just coming to me there when when, when it comes like there's there there's probably uh you know there, there, there's probably a little a, a reason there why so many Catholics even subconsciously just discard that topic of climate change and environment and uh, and throw it in the in the dustbin so to speak. I mean, there's no doubt, Brian, that when you know, if, and I think the the Irish government has started implementing, you know, obviously the Green Party are in uh, one of their coalition partners now, and they they will certainly be pushing uh, sort of sustainability is in in, in the, the plan, the program for government and policy. And there's no there's no doubt that in in some ways, uh, it's changes you know are difficult, and you know, I do think of. Think of the government's recent decision to to close the the peat burning plant down in in Offaly, yeah. uh, near near Clonmel Noise actually, uh, near, yeah, um, Shannon Bridge I think, and um, like that's obviously a huge huge issue, you know, uh, uh, pain and uh, and sort of suffering for for the people whose whose livelihood is, you know, it's come from digging the turf and, you know, and then and, and the power plant and, and all that. Um, and, uh, and part of, I guess, the, the challenge for, for government and, and we, and for, for, for us as citizens as well, it's, and, and definitely as Catholics, is to kind of be able to say, like, yes, this, this will be hard, you know, and you can't, let, let's not, you know, we can't dress this up as, oh, we have this bright new, you know, eco future ahead of us, and we're just going to waltz into it, and we'll all have electric cars. It'll be great, and you know, and God, I'd love, I'd, I'd love to drive an electric car. It'd be cool. Uh, but no, like the, this is a, a, a this is where you introduce the idea of an ecological or a transition. This this isn't going to be sort of flicking a switch, and sort of saying, okay, we've we've turned off the the peak. The peat burning, you know, electric power plant, and uh, we we've turned on the uh, whatever, like the solar energy or the like. It's it's a transition, and uh, it's going to take time. And you know, and I, I don't know how it's working working out then in the in the Midlands and uh, exactly, but I, I know that there are there are new initiatives. The government has invested, you know, uh, money there for for. Uh, for caring for the bogs and you know there's various things they're doing but I'm sure you know I'm sure it wasn't perfect uh, and I'm sure some people are out of a job and and you just kind of hope that okay but you don't I know it's hard it, it is hard we have to we have to admit that but ultimately it's worth it and your children and your grandchildren will appreciate your sacrifice uh, and it's not it's not it is a sacrifice let's call it for what it is it is a sacrifice but it's not a sacrifice in vain. And, um, and then look, people living with, you know, just losing their sense of control that, oh my God, the government swooped in and boom, I lost my job or, I mean, it must be awful. Um, and, and again, just to speak about this from a faith perspective, uh, you know, as Christians, you know, we say, yes, you know, crosses will come if, if we're living this, uh, there, there will be sacrifice, guaranteed. Jesus, you know, we follow Jesus, and we're followers of Jesus, and Jesus suffered, you know, uh, you know, more than any of us, you know, and uh, we're all going to have our share in that. Uh, and just to say, yeah, okay, so when it'll look different for for everyone, if 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 we do go through this ecological transition over over time, um. Yeah, there'll be times when each of us will be saying, yes, this is hard. Uh, I, I have whatever, I've made a sacrifice or some sacrifices being asked of me here. I suppose as Christians, we say, yes, yes, it is hard. Uh, we're not denying that, we can't deny that. And, um, and if we're just looking for the easy way, 
uh, well then our you know children and grandchildren and future generations they're they're going to pay the price they would really pay a much higher price so can we sort of take it upon ourselves now to say yes yes we we'll pay the price uh, or as much of it as we can you know i mean whatever it looks like in people's eyes and i'm, and I'm not i'm not i'm not downplaying the difficulty of this but i'm trying to, the opposite and just to say yes um and because there's again you know the the, the natural way of as uh, you know we're all human and would be say oh that sounds difficult uh, or you know the green party want to close down this or that or whatever i'll just avoid it like the plague and well that's okay it's understandable you know but from a christian point of view you're kind of thinking okay sacrifice will be involved guaranteed but let it not be a sacrifice in vain let it be a sacrifice that's really for something uh and and that afterwards you know 20 30 years down the road we can say it was worth it and and god is with us you know in this and ultimately you know god will see things right and we'll come out of this on the other side sort of hopefully all you know as as, as a community you know in a much better place um, so yeah just just a few thoughts on that yeah because in short i guess what you're saying there is if we don't take on the cross of christ now and leave it go down uh the line to future generations the cross that they're going to have to carry is going to be way bigger and way heavier um, and way more demanding. Um, so the mm -hmm. sacrifice now on our end is going to, uh, at this time, is going to hopefully alleviate the suffering uh, 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 of future generations. Please God, please God, Brian. Yeah, yeah, I think. And you know, this is what this is this is what uh, sort of. You know, environmental climate scientists are telling us they don't have a crystal ball. They don't have what they they do have very sophisticated, you know, models, mathematical models of, you know, in, in the same way that you know the, the the COVID scientists are predicting what the, you know, what the, the number of infections will be next year or next week or whatever. Climate scientists, environmental scientists are able to say, okay, these these are the likely most likely outcomes in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years into the future. And they're, you know, they're, they're not a crystal ball. They're not infallible, but there is a consensus there in the scientific community and, and with climate scientists. And, you know, as, as Christians, how many times, you know, have you, have you heard a talk on faith and science? You know, that, yeah, that, you know, I mean, in response to, you know, Richard Dawkins and, and the new atheism who were sort of claiming that as scientists, you know, they couldn't believe in God or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> all of you, I won't go through it all again. And then you'd so many, you know, Christian, uh, you know, apolo apologetics out there saying, no, faith and science go together. And, and that's, I would say that's kind of a core belief now for a lot of, a lot of Christians, that faith and science go together. And let's let's include climate science in that. You know, like we're we're talking about very smart people who care, and and have devoted their lives to protecting human civilization from ecological disaster. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I don't I don't know what's not to trust here. Yeah. And you know, let's you know, if we do believe in sort of faith and science, well, then let's. Let's sort of listen to climate scientists. Uh, it's a very, and they, they you know, I think, uh, so uh, there's, um, I think it's carbon, I can't remember what website it was, but I saw, anyway, a survey, 99% of climate scientists believe or that it's, it's human activity, which is causing this sort of climate change and which, and, you know, and it's going in this direction. So um, yes, uh, so if we can, whatever sacrifices we make now uh, will alleviate much greater sacrifices for future generations and for our children and, and grandchildren and, and, and all the future generations. So yes, um, 
let's let's sit up and and pay attention and um, yeah no that's that's powerful it's um you know I, i'm actually really enjoying this talk tonight because even like it's it's, it's not often i've heard discussions on the Lod sea from an actual, you know, bringing Jesus into the center of it, looking at it from the real Catholic perspective. And when you do, gosh, the onus is really on us, the onus and responsibility, because like, this is a challenging talk for me, because I know there's way more I can do, because I know, you know, uh, yeah, I recycle and, and all that in my home. But at the same time, you know, a lot of time I can pay this, this topic uh, lip service and uh i know myself i'm i'm guilty of it and um and it, this is good this conversation is good because it's challenged me um you know it's like when we go into prayer you know we don't want to go into prayer to be comfortable we enter into prayer to for a relationship with god to speak to god to communicate with god we should be challenged to challenge in a way to change ourselves and this is fantastic as yeah. well it's, it's like that and and brian maybe if um we've been talking for a while about an hour and 20 minutes now maybe we might we <laughs> might might start <laughs> nattering away uh we might start wrapping up but um i'm an hour ahead over here as well oh yeah um, so it's getting late but um just to, just to bring that point into it yeah about prayer like this this is a great you know when you don't it's so hard to know where to start uh i would say start with prayer mm. uh start lord okay i've been part of this bad story, uh, you know, mea culpa, uh, I have I have sinned in this regard, but uh, I'm open to change. And um, please show me how, please guide me. Because uh, it's it's not obvious, yeah. you know, what to do. It's, not, it's genuinely not obvious. Uh, and there are, there are so many things we could possibly do. Uh, uh, you know, you've mentioned recycling, whatever, the things we buy, the things we eat, blah, blah, blah. Just say, God, where, where do you want me to start? You know, uh, I'm here and, and just please guide me and guide my family. And can this be something we do together as a family? You know, it can be, could it be something that brings us, actually brings us together as a family? Um, I'll tell you, so I'll share, Brian, on what, where I started. Uh, and um, I started by uh, baking bread. <laughs> which how, that? how does that relate yeah, to yeah so I exactly yeah um i just realized that everything most of the things i consume or eat i buy and i i never make anything ever anymore and i just thought okay i'm going to start by making bread and by sharing it with my community members and it just it's a way of making the household getting into that mindset of we don't like I don't have to buy everything. I can make I can make something, you know, and and sort of uh, just uh, you know. So for and and that grew into you know for example I I buy a lot of my clothes now secondhand. I go to a I'm perfectly good clothes by the way. You know I'm really not wearing rags. You know, um, but. It was just getting myself to okay. I, can I can I break this habit of I just go to the shop and I buy and I buy and I buy and I buy um, and uh, so yeah. For me, it started with baking bread, which was kind of a symbolic act, you know. It was, uh, but my God, it's it does me the world of good and it tastes great, and my community, my fellow Jesuits, love it when I do it. Um, and and then that sort of and it and it just kind of grows from there. You know, and they said like if I start buying secondhand clothes, and uh, which are imperfectly, which are effectively new clothes, but just somebody doesn't want it. You know, um, and little things like that, Brian. You know, and we we'll all, you know, we all, and I, and I have a long way to go, a long way to go. I, I promise you. But uh, bring it to prayer and ask God just for that that first little uh, sort of pointer in the right direction. And so, what you're saying there, kind of. That more or less kind of brings us now. I know chapter three and chapter four was very much about the ecological point of view and people can can read those chapters themselves. But what you're saying there, that call to action, that kind of leads us to chapter five because that's what that was about very much that, um, yeah, what can we do with this situation? So 
what you're speaking about there is like a very simple small action but it's still a step in the right direction yeah it, it can be a, it can be a symbolic action that that just reminds you of okay this is an important thing for me uh, and whether you know if that means that you know you know you as a family or we decided that you know every wednesday now we're going to eat vegetarian and okay we're not saving the planet but it's a start and it's meaningful and it means something to us and it says something about the direction we want to go in and you know as the kids grow up they'll know that this is an important issue for us as a family and there's there is something about doing a, making a symbolic gesture or you know, saying this is this expresses something of, of who i am um and yeah, so so there's there's those yeah chapters five and six uh, uh, yeah it's, it's it's more action oriented uh, both from the the point of view of the individuals you know what do we do as, as individuals how do we do we change our our pattern patterns of consumption and what we buy and etc. Uh, but also then sort of collective change how do there, there's advice in there I suppose for for policymakers and uh, uh, that that's a good opportunity to talk about. Um, sort of structures of sin for for Catholics as well that you know these are there, there's ways in which you know you, everybody needs to everybody needs to drive to work you know I mean if you have if you have to get to work like, you know, there's people there who just have no option but to drive to work and it's not it's not your fault that the only cars available for the most part are petrol or diesel that's it's not a personal sin to drive to work it's not a personal sin but it is a structural sin which you're not personally responsible for but sort of the way the system is kind of set up can have sinful elements to it uh, and that's that's part of uh, john paul ii introduced this to catholic social teaching called structures of sin and uh yeah and so, so something like yeah, um, you know, fossil fuels, you know, the way we burn so much oil and coal, that's nobody's fault. It's no, it's not my fault, Brian, it's not your fault. It, that's the life, world was like that when we were born and, and we just sort of went along with it. But together as societies, you know, can we start, you know, agitating? Can we start um, campaigning, whatever, for these systems to change? So can we move, you know, transition from, fossil fuels to renewable energies you know and that's you know and, and again you're sort of saying god can you help me to be part of this transition um you know with wider issues or you know if you have a choice between you know who do i do i buy my electricity from just whatever the the regular provider or, or the provider that's you know got turbines off the east coast or, or whatever you know uh, wind turbines you know uh, little things like this just gently pushing, you know, pushing towards the new, preferring the new renewable options and those more systemic things. Uh, I'm so proud of my, my dad. He's actually taking, uh, he bought, he took the, he took the, the leap and he bought himself an electric vehicle, an electric car. So he's got, it's, it hasn't arrived yet. It's, it's basically, I think it's his Santa present this year, <laughs> a big one. Uh, and uh, he was thinking about it for years and he was just waiting to see, you know, when would a good one come along? It's a bit more affordable and you know, decent range and all that. And uh, and it's not and it's not that you know electric vehicles are the answer either, but they're a sort of a step in the right direction. They're you know, it's better than the the old diesel <laughs> guzzler that he was that he was driving up until now. So yeah, I mean, it's step by step, Brian. It's step by step, and and just just say just keep inviting god into that process and say god you know show us you know we're we're open um and, and just just to make these you know continue you know step by step uh you know slowly changing over time and and it'll just become a normal thing you know eventually yeah. it just you know it'll just i don't uh, like, yeah it'll it'll just become a new normal you know we keep on we keep on talking about that but i think that's the way to go that's fantastic. Um, look, Father Nile, I know uh, at the moment it's 10 past 10 here. <laughs> I'm at night time. 
10 yeah. past. I like, totally forgetting oh, it. I'm sorry. Ahead. God, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> in fairness to you, I, I to give a, a big thank you to you because I'll mention what happened last night. Uh, <laughs> yes, the, yes, the evening. I know we, we agreed this. Um, we agreed this interview just before Christmas, so we're on the 9th of January now, and just before Christmas, we we, we agreed to do this and and that. But you know, if it's any other time of the year, everything goes into the Google Calendar or or, or whatever. But you coming up to Christmas, Christmas you're slowing down. You said that, I said brilliant. That's perfect. That's next year. I remember <laughs> yeah, that. 2021. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember that. I mean, uh, I came home yesterday evening. Lana went out to an appointment. I had the kids. And Niall, you text me saying, "Hi, Brian, we're still on for this evening," and I was like, "Oh no, <laughs> oh no!" So, thank Brian, you so much. I, well, full, full confession, full disclosure, yeah. Brian, I was sort of hoping that you had forgotten about it because <laughs> uh, one of one of the guys in the house here, there's a great fella from Mexico, and it was his birthday. So oh, very was, good. And I was invited to to go along and celebrate. Um, so. I was sort of hoping you had forgotten, to be honest. Worked then. Out, so worked it, all, it worked out well for everyone. <laughs> That's uh, great. Yeah, That's yeah, great. Yeah. But uh, look, for Ryan, night, I, yep. I, lo- I love the chats. It's it's great talking to you, really. I enjoy this. It's the second time you've done it now, and I get a lot from it, too. It's great. It's great for me, too. So thanks. for. I think you're doing a wonderful thing with your podcast. I really do. Uh, uh, we're, 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 so we're plugging away. <laughs> I, 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 as, well. I, as I was yeah, saying, yeah. Uh, just before we finish up, I have to give an apology to my wife because um as people can see here i was using i was setting up behind this curtain here and as lana said earlier on she says there is no way you're going on camera <laughs> with the wrinkles on that and i was like what wrinkles would be fine uh, and I, you know what most guys they look at it it could be on fire they're not gonna even notice yeah, but yeah. women i know even my mother's watching this now she's like you didn't even bring an iron to the curtain. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I've actually never heard of anyone bringing an iron to the curtain, but apparently it's done. So yeah. anyway, that's the that's the way. But look, Father Nile, thanks so much. I really appreciate that of you giving your time. Um, be just as, uh, before we end, would you mind leading us in a closing prayer? Sure, of course, Brian. Yeah. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks uh, for for this conversation. I give you thanks for paving the way home podcast uh, for for the mission you've given Brian and Lana and everyone else involved. Um, ask you to a special blessing on everyone who's listening uh, to this podcast, to this episode. Uh, bless them, uh, protect them, uh, lead lead them on. Uh, Lord, just always keep us uh, close to yourself uh, and uh, full of encouragement and full of faith, hope, and love. Uh, and may, may just teach us as well just to, just to express that uh, in how we, how we use the things of this world, how we live within your creation, uh, your, your precious uh, creation, which you love very much, which you've given to us. Uh, we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father Nile, thanks a million. God bless you. Well done, Brian. Thank you.